Um, without further delay, let's start uh, our session. So, uh, hello everyone. Uh, it's this is a session for cases five, and welcome to the session of interconnect and 3D stacking. So, uh, we will have uh, six speakers here, and uh, uh, three for long talks and uh, uh, three for short talks, and they are all uh, they are all very interesting uh, talks. So. Uh, the short, uh, the long talks will uh, last for 10 minutes and short talks will run uh, three minutes and uh, there will be question answering after each of the talk. So uh, all the audience, please feel free to ask after each talk. So without further delay, uh, so uh, maybe uh, let's invite uh, our first speaker, uh, Professor uh, Xiao Hang Wang uh, to give the first talk on the secure data transmission, uh, transmission over the insecure Networks on chip by modulating uh, interpacket delays. So, uh, Professor Wang received a Bachelor of Engineering PhD degree in Communication and Electrical uh, Engineering from Zhejiang University. Um, uh, he is a current uh, professor at Zhejiang University, and uh, he was received of PDP uh, 2015 and uh, VOSI uh, SOC 2014 Best Paper Awards. And he was uh, a session chair, special session chair of NOCS 2018, uh, steering committee of NOC ARC uh, 2014 to 2018, and the TPC chair of ICCS 2021. And he also served as a guest editor of the uh, mathematics journal and uh, microelectronics journals. And his research interests include many core architecture, power efficient architectures, uh, optimal control and NLC based systems. So, uh, welcome, Professor Wang. Thank you, Professor Zhang. Uh, Wen Xu will present um, in Shanghai and I will answer your questions. Okay, yeah, that's great. So, uh, so uh, uh, the title of the report paper is Secure Data Transmission over insecure network on chip by modulating interpacket delays. And uh, uh, this report uh, should have been performed by Xiao Hang Wang, professor. And, uh, but he, came, um, he was unable to be present here. So uh, I will do this report on behalf of it. Uh, okay, next slide. Oh, thank you. Uh, this report is organized as the following parts. And next slide. Uh, he's next. Oh, okay. And uh, okay, to reduce the time to market, uh, a cheap knock is often adopted from the third party vendor, and there has been a great concern that it might have been compromised by hardware trojans. So, we need to think about how to uh, ensure the secure transmission in the untrusted knock. And several approaches have been proposed, uh, among which the authenticated encryption and the secure uh, cover channel are most effective. Of these two approaches, a secure cover channel tends to preserve confidentially better and uh, incurs a lower information processing overhead. Essentially, a secure cover channel is able to secretly transmit data on top of the existing network traffic rather than directly exposing data to adversaries as an encryption scheme does. So our work concentrates on the IPD-based secure channel. We use interpacket delay called IPD to transmit the sensitive information. The transmitter enc uh, encodes bit one or bit zero as a long or short interpacket delay. As shown in this figure, the gap between packet one and packet two is 100 cycles, representing bit one, and there is a gap of only 10 cycles between packet two and packet three, and representing bit zero. Uh, okay, next. Yeah. Uh, uh, yes, yes. The receiver covers uh, embedded binary data by comparing the IPDs against the predefined threshold. So in this scheme, there are two problems to be solved. The first problem is how to select the optimal threshold. We propose a novel BER, to, BER model to obtain the optimal decision threshold at the receiver. Through experiments, we found that there are two peaks in the delay distribution of IPD-based channel. 
which is different from the noise. So it can be detected easily. So the second problem is, uh, okay, next. Uh, yeah, so the next, yeah, the next problem is, uh, so the next problem is, uh, please, uh, please return to the, uh, please return to the last slice. Okay, okay, yes. And uh, is to how to improve the stiltiness of IPD based channel to make it be like noise. Uh, and we adopt NBMT code to smooth out the delay distribution. Okay, next. And uh, it will show the flow chart of the transmitter and the receiver respectively in the IPD based channel. And the next. Next slide. Can you show the next slides? This one? Oh, yes. And for the transmitter, uh, it generates the IPD based the chat, uh, IPD check sequence according to the value of phase three and the given duration is shown as L0 and L1. And uh, next, to show the whole, uh, yes. And uh, yes, yes, show the formula. And uh, corresponding to bit zero and bit one, respectively. Then the transmitter sent the, sets the sending time of packets based on the calculated IPD sequence. And next slide, please. And for the receiver, it extracts the interval between the arrival times of two consecutive packets and then compares the interval uh, with a threshold to get the original cover bit. The next slide, please. Uh, yes, to show the whole formula. To determine the optimal threshold at the receiver, we propose the VR model. Here we show the formula to calculate the effective throughput. Then we take the derivative of this formula with, uh, with respect to the threshold T. Then we can see it, a function of the bit error rate, PE. PE, uh, next slide please. And PE is calculated as the sum of the probability that uh, bit one is received at a bit zero and the probability that the same bit zero is received at a bit one. And next slide. Now we rewrite the derivative formula. When this formula is equal to zero, PE reaches minimum. That is to say, when the probability of sending bit one is equal to sending bit zero, we get the optimal threshold. Which value is the opti uh, is the average of the duration of IPV? Next slide, please. Since uh, the malicious node occasionally drop packets, we propose the communication protocol uh, to handle packet loss. Once the packet is sent, the transmitter starts the timer. If the timer times out, it is considered that there is a packet loss, and then the transmitter resends the packets until it receives and acknowledgement from the receiver. Next slide. Uh, we mentioned before that the baseline IPD channel is easy to be detected because there is a big difference between the delay distribution of the IPD channel and noise. So how to make the uh, 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 next to show the whole figure is uh, the whole content, yes. And uh, how to make the delay distribution similar to noise. And next slide. Uh, yes, uh, uh, the last slide to show the whole content. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, yes. And we, uh, we achieve it by increasing the diversity of packets intervals by NBMT code. Next slide, please. So what is NBMT code? It maps n bit binary symbols to n bit ternary symbols. There are two simple rules to follow. The distribution of ternary values 0, 1, and 2 are ideally to be equal, and the selected code should have error correction ability with a minimum handling distance. Next slide, please. Let's take one example. Yes, to show the whole content. The one bit binary code zero is mapped to the two bit ternary code uh, two zero, and the bit one is mapped to the ternary code zero one because the selected ternary codes have the minimum variance and the one bit error code can be corrected. 
the mapping relationships are stored in the codebook and are shared between the transmitter and the receiver. Uh, next slide, please. To support the block code, we add block encoding to the transmitter and block decoding to the receiver. Next slide, please. Uh, in uh, yes, to show the whole content. Uh, yes, yes, that's right. To support, uh, in this slide, we present the uh, configuration for simulation and uh, uh, the malicious node has the ability to detect and inject the useless packets in, uh, to the network. And next slide, please. Yes, here we show the comparison of PER and the effective throughput under different network sizes. As we can see, when the network size is 16 by 16, the PR of the block coding scheme is 30% lower than that of the baseline scheme due to the error resilience, and the effective throughput is 33% higher. Next slide, please. Okay. More experiments are performed to compare the PR and detection uh, accuracy with different noises. The noises are generated from the East Pass and Parsec benchmarks. As we can see, the block coding and uh, co the block coding based channel reduces detection accuracy by uh, 20% and 50% uh, respectively. Next slide, please. Uh, uh, yeah, we performed the experiments to compare the proposed method with other two uh, encoding methods for the Hoffman code is its length varies and uh, uh, please, uh, ne next to show the whole content, yes. Yes, yes, yes. And uh, for the Hoffman code, it's length varies, but does not have error correction. For the GUI code, checklists have to be added to each code group, so the effective throughput is much lower than that of the proposed method. Okay, next, next slide. Uh, okay. Then we performed the experiments to compare our proposed method with other secure transmission method. And the first method to compare is the uh, thermal cover channel known as TCC. And the PR of TCC is 1.5 times of uh, our proposed IP based channel and the effective throughput of TCC is only 6,000 of, of our proposed IP based channel. And next slide please. Uh, the second method to compare is cache cover channel. The average PR of the cache cover channel is 43% higher than that of our proposed IPD based channel. And the effective throughput of the IPD based channel is 78% uh, lower, uh, higher than that of the cache cover channel. Uh, next slide, please. And then we perform experiments to compare our proposed method with hardware-based encryption method. The hardware-based encryption scheme requires additional hardware circuits for AES coding and decoding, and it consumes uh, 48 millijoules when encrypting 1,000 bits. And as a comparison, our proposed block coding-based IPD channel requires no additional circuit, and its energy consumption is only 7.5% of the encryption scheme. Next slide, please. In brief, our proposed block coding based IPD channel can reduce PR to as low as 0.3%, achieving an effective throughput of 2.3 multiplied by 10 to the, uh, five, uh, to the power of 5 BPS. And it can uh, and has lower PR and overhead and higher throughput than the competing methods. And next slide. Uh, that is all of my presentation, and any questions can be asked directly because uh, Professor Wang is listening online and he uh, is responsible for answering your questions. Thank you. Thanks for the speaker. So, any questions from the audience? Yeah. You can speak up or uh, type your question in the uh, chat box. Yeah. 
or any questions from the offline audience? So actually, I just have one simple question that is, uh, you choose like a true coding uh, framework to compare with, right? And then, uh, so why to choose this two? And uh, are they state of art? Um, yeah, this is a very uh, good question. Um, actually, we uh, choose them because um, they are widely used in communications. And of course, they are not uh, state of the art code, but they are widely used. So uh, we adopt this code to compare. Thank you. Thanks. Are there any other questions? So, uh, yeah, if no questions, uh, uh, thank for the speaker again. And uh, um, so uh, then we can uh, st start the second talk. Okay. So the second talk is coming uh, from uh, the, uh, Mr. Chen Jiaxian, uh, Chen Jiaxian, okay. and uh, the paper title is uh, GCIM uh, Toward Efficient Processing for Graph Convolutional Neural Networks uh, in 3D Stacked Memory. Okay. So, um, welcome, uh, Mr. Chen. So, okay. Uh, hello. Yes. Uh, good day, everyone. My, my name is Jia Xin Chen. I'm, and I'm currently a PhD student from Shenzhen University. First of all, I'll talk about the background and motivation of our work. Uh, graph convolutional networks have become a powerful deep learning approach uh, for graph structured data. Tricians are widely applied to social networks, recommendation systems, and molecular biology. Tricians mainly consist of two phases, aggregation and combination. The aggregation phase is similar to graph processing, uh, which is uh, it, it aggregates all its neighboring features uh, Uh, it is always memory bound due to the uh, irregular input graph. The combination phase uh, typically uses a multi layer perception. It is uh, computation bound due to the regular matrix operations. Uh, due to the sparse and uncertain topology of the input graph, GCNs have significant random memory access. Previous work relies on dedicated SRAM buffers to alleviate irregular memory access. However, the limited SRAM capacity and poor data reusability still lead to significant data movement and memory bandwidth bottleneck. The 3D stack memory provides a viable solution with high bandwidth and memory uh, and the parallelism. The typical 3D stack memory is shown in this slide. With through silicon vias, multiple theorem dies can stack on a base bar, uh, constituting a memory cube. This memory cube is partitioned into several volts in the vertical direction. Each volt can work independently uh, with a volt controller. Abundant bank memory banks can provide significant bank level bandwidth and parallelism. With the emerging 3D stacking technology, logic, the computing logic can be integrated into theorem dice for high bandwidth or integrated for sorry. or integrated into the base data for sufficient computational capability. We argue that the 3D stack computing in memory architecture can provide, can 
process efficiency efficiently since it can reduce memory movement, provide high memory bandwidth and a huge DRAM capacity for data reuse. To fully explore the CIM architecture, the memory bound aggregation operations can be uploaded to the base dice, to the memory dice, while the computation bound combination operations can be uploaded to the base dice. We conducted a preliminary experiment to test to confirm our observation. Two uploading schemes are tested. Scheme A uploads uh, aggregation and combination phase to the base stack, while scheme B uploaded, up uploads the uh, aggregation and combination phase to DRAM dice and base stack respectively. From the table, we can see scheme B outperforms scheme A for all the workloads. Next, we'll present GCIM, a, soft, a hardware software co-design architect accelerator for GCNs based on 3D stack CIM architecture. The design of view of GCN is shown in this slide. At the hardware level, we modify the existing 3D stack memory to support GCN operations. Uh, at the software level, we present a graph partitioning and mapping strategy to reduce data movement and guarantee workload balancing. First of all, first, we'll talk about the hardware architecture. Uh, we add a lightweight logic unit at the base die at, at each bank groups for the aggregation phase. We will adopt a pool based aggregation strategy as shown in this figure. Uh, for the given vertex V1, it will pull the or its neighboring vertex V vertices V2 and V3. The local vertex V2 will be refreshed to uh, refresh from memory banks to the processing unit. Uh, in the meanwhile, the non-local vertex V3 will be refreshed in parallel from other bank groups to perform computation. Thus, GCIM can exploit bank level bandwidth and parallelism. For the computation bound uh, combination phase, we apply systolic arrays at the base star. We also use batching and await stationary data flow for better date uh, waste data reuse. Uh, although the 3D, uh, although the CIM architecture provides a, a 3D stack layout to uh, adjust uh, just the bandwidth issue. Uh, there still like a mapping strategy can, that can fully optimize both data locality and workload balancing for GCNs. Challenges are raised. Therefore, we propose the graph aware, uh, locality aware graph partitioning and the vault and bank level mapping. We adopt community detection to destroy the potential data locality of the input graph. We GCIM partitions the input graph into several communities where vertices within the same community have strong connections. Uh, while com vertices among different communities that have weak connection. After the graph partitioning, GCNs uh, map communities to different boards to allocate communities evenly with deployed matches to measure the deviation between actual and ideal allocations. These matches consider the numbers of both vertices and edges uh, allocated to each vote. Then, a uh, greedy strategy is used to minimize the deviation and get an even allocation. Since the adjacent vertices have strong connections after the graph positioning, uh, GCIMs map, maps vertices sequentially to the bank memory bank group, groups to keep data locality. Then we only need to minimize the aggregation latency for workload balancing. A simplified performance model is proposed to uh, evaluate the aggregation latency. Then 
a dynamic program algorithm is used to separate and map uh, vertices uh, to bank groups uh, according to the evaluate latency. Uh, finally, we'll present our experimental evaluations as follows. Uh, we evaluate our proposed GCIM with uh, a, a set of representative GCM models and graph data sets. We use PYG CPU, high GCM, CIM high GCM as our baseline. The simulation is, uh, is mainly based on DRAM SIM3, a cycle accurate simulator. GCIM can achieve significant performance speed up compared with PYG CPU, IGCN, and CIM IGCN. Uh, the performance gap mainly, uh, mainly due to the uh, high bandwidth and parallel levelism provided by the CIM architecture. For energy saving, GCIM can reduce energy consumption effectively, effectively uh, compared to the baselines. As shown in this figure, uh, GCIM consumes, consumes less uh, leakage energy and aspirin dynamic energy compared with high GCM and CIM high GCM. For mapping algorithm, uh, GCIM can reduce processing latency by 20% compared with the baseline. Uh, GCIM can also increase bank group hit rate by 27% compared with uh, the baseline. This is mainly due to, uh, due to adopting the locality aware graph partitioning. To conclude our work, we propose GCIM, a hardware software co design approach to exploit efficient processing of GCNs on the 3D stack GIM architecture. The experiment's result shows uh, our work can efficiently reduce processing latency and energy consumption compared with baseline schemes. That's all for my presentation. Uh, thank you for listening. Uh, thanks uh, for the speaker. So any questions from the audience? Uh, yeah, uh, there, here is a question. You mentioned that GCIM is modified on hybrid memory queue. Can GCIM be applied to high byte-wise memory? Uh, yes, I, I think it can be applied to high bandwidth memory uh, with some modification. Uh, the main difference between uh, HMC, uh, hybrid memory cube, and the uh, high bandwidth memory uh, is their channel or organization. The HM HMC uh, is, uh, uses distributed TSVs and a uh, vibrant channel organization, uh, while HBM uh, uses a uh, centralized TSV and, uh, and cross-grain channel organization, uh, but they are quite similar. Uh, the band, they, these two types of 3D stack memory can provide high bandwidth and can support uh, near bank computing. Uh, therefore, I think <laughs> Uh, it can be applied to high bandwidth memory. Okay. Other questions? Um, okay, so, uh, yeah, it's a, uh, with there, there's uh, more questions at, uh, uh, later, and then uh, please find like Ms. Chen in the poster uh, session, we do discuss more. And uh, uh, before we go to the next talk, actually, let's uh, um, introduce more, maybe Mr. Chen, uh, besides uh, like his brief introduction himself. So he is actually um, uh, working on the embedded systems, hardware, software, co-design, and storage uh, systems. 
So uh, any audience is welcome to, to discuss with this Mr. Chen Mo uh, later in the poster session. Okay, so uh, then uh, without uh, any other questions, so uh, that goes to our uh, third talk. And um, so the third talk is about the uh, accelerating large scale uh, graph neural network training on a crossbar dead. And uh, the speaker is uh, Mr. Uh, oh, uh, oh, Bogo, uh, if I address to you correctly. Okay. So, uh, Mr. Uh, Obogo, uh, received his, uh, uh, bachelor degree in electrical and uh, electronic engineering from, uh, Obifami, uh, Oluwo University, uh, Nigeria in uh, 2019. He's currently pursuing, uh, the PhD degree with the School of Electric, Electrical Engineering and, uh, uh, computer science, Washington State University. Um, his current uh, research uh, interests include machine learning, hardware acceleration for deep learning, uh, emerging non-volatile memories. Okay, so uh, welcome. So let me share my screen. Um, can everyone see my screen? Yes. So, uh, so hello everyone. Um, my name is Chupu Fernaya Ogogu, um, Chups for short. And today I'll be um, presenting my paper on accelerating large-scale graph neural network on um, graph neural network training on a crossbar diet, along with my collaborators at Deep University. So um, a brief outline of today's introduction. First, of today's talk, first I introduced um, machine learning models, specifically graph neural networks, as well as the architectures used for um, training and inference. Then I motivate the use for um, processing in memory and computing architectures based on um, real crossbars. And then some more background and overview of GNN training and on 3D PIM architectures. Then I um, introduce the um, main um, topic in this world, which is um, which we call diet GNN and how um, we implement pruning um, for GNNs. And then I present the results and conclude the paper. So as we know, um, training on the edge is, has been a natural progression for cloud computing, where instead of collecting all the data in the cloud infrastructure, we, we kind of distribute the power to try to do as much processing as possible on the edge. Um, just like in Google's federated learning and many other um, proposed um, schemes. The advantage of this is that you know it gives us smarter models, low latency, less power con consumption for um, server scale computing systems, and also reduces the cost of running them. Um, but one challenge is that machine learning models are very large. They have billions of parameters, and, as, and also, um, edge devices have a limited memory bandwidth, and this is um, significant. Um, this is known as the power, and as well as the memory one. Um, so, are there solutions we can explore to solve this um, challenge and make edge computing uh, feasible in the very near future? So, um, one of these challenge, one of these solutions includes um, model pruning, which we're we'll looking at specifically in this work. And also, um, quantization has been proposed in um, several other works, which we will not get into. And then um, we propose a computing architecture which reduces memory, um, which reduces memory and latencies, and improves um, speeds of computing. So, graph neural network specifically works um, operates on non-structured um, data, with non-Euclidean um, structured data, just like basically graphs, and they learn features through aggregation and um, through neighborhood expansion. And um, the main task for graph um, neural networks is basically graph identification, where you, um, graph classification, where you want to um, identify what type of graph this is, or node classification, identifying node link prediction, and many other applications that you can see on the figure on the right. So one common question is why don't we use um, GPUs to achieve this? And GPUs have some significant um, challenges. They are, um, GNN itself is, very, very compute and data movement intensive. And GPUs are not very optimized for them um, to solve some of these challenges because of their high area requirements and power um, requirements, uh, as well as their very low um, energy efficiency and limited bandwidth, limited memory bandwidth. So are there alternative computing parameters we can explore, which um, we, um, we talk about in, on this slide. So processing in memory um, has basically been proposed and it's a paradigm where we um, rather than having two different um, units to um, do the computation, that is for um, 
computing um, CPU, GPU, and we have the memory cell, we sort of integrate this into um, one architecture where um, you have significantly lesser amount of data movement and you can do um, storage and computing in the same place. Um, division based crossbars have been proposed for um, achieving this, and one of their key advantages is that they are very energy efficient, they are very fast, and they give um, more than 100 times computation speed up. Uh, so, um, GNN training, um, here on this slide, I want to get into some brief specifics of GNN training. So, we, here we are dealing with very sparse adjacency matrices, and we have node level feature vectors, as we can see in the figure on the right, um, the X1 to um, Xn and then which goes in as input into um, a GNN consisting of weights. And then we also simultaneously have to do um, edge computation on the right, where um, we compute the results of the vertex computation with the um, adjacency matrix. Now, this problem is challenging in the sense that it results in, amount, in a large amount of on chip computation because the edge computation and, vert and, and um, vertex computation are done in on different are mapped to different um, compute elements, and then you have to communicate with them during training. And it's um, it's also com as it's also very compute intensive. So, in um, a common architecture which has been proposed um, is the three D um, PIM architecture, where you have different um, planar layers stacked on top of each other and connected by true silicon wire. And the advantage of this architecture is that it gives us higher communication bandwidths. Um, we have short time interconnect due to the short time interconnect, and it's very area efficient. And also, it can uh, help us um, address the um, significantly high on chip communication traffic. So, on the right hand side, I'm showing how we actually map a um, weight matrix in a given GNN to um, each of the um, compute elements. So, the IME here represents EC2 multiplier accumulate units, so which consists of real cross by itself. So this is how we map to um, a given um, weight matrix to the GNN, GNN weight matrix to the um, crossbars. So one problem here is that the, we require a large amount of hardware, large, large, a large amount of crossbars to actually store GNN with because they are very over parameters, consisting of many parameters. And also, we in, the, we, in this work, we explore training techniques to shrink the model and, um, and speed up computation. So in this work, we specifically um, leverage a method called lottery ticket pruning. So it's an iterative pruning which enables us to find um, some networks that can be trained from scratch and match the um, original accuracy of the um, prune model. So the steps are very, very simple. So we randomly initialize, initialize the um, weights of the network and then you know, pr train to arrive at some opt optimal weights and prune them and then reset and repeat the process iteratively then we arrive at the matching ticket as we can see in the figure on the right. So other works have proposed various um, pruning methods, LTP and grass pacification, um, and also cross by way pruning techniques. But in this work, we specifically propose um, a method that actually saves a um, significant amount of hardware. So it's a structured pruning method which helps us to save crossbars as well as the associated um, peripheral circuits. So here we can see, we call this framework um, diet GNN. It takes in the unpruned model as well as the crossbar size and um, its um, resolution, as well as um, the bit precision, and then performs this iterative pruning and um, reduces the amount of um, whole crossbars as well as the um, um, peripheral circuits. So we can see here that we are saving both sample and hold circuitry, ADCs and DACs. Um, so the algorithm is shown here. and one of the advantages, um, it, obvious, the obvious advantage of this method is that we can reduce um, peripheral circuit area and reduce um, energy consumption. Also, we also found that this method is actually um, scalable. That is, models can be reused multiple times and they can actually even be transferred to some other to other data sets. So, um, for our experimental setup, we use um, four planar layers in the 3D architecture I described earlier, um, and then. We consider five real-world um, graph benchmarks, PPI, um, protein protein interaction, Reddit data sets, Amazon and Flickr, and as well as Yelp. So we have five data sets here ranging in, um, in, in size from very large scale graphs to you know, smaller graphs like as we see in Flickr and PPI. So first we do um, a design space exploration to find what is the optimal, cro um, cross optimal crossbar size that gives us 
um, the best energy uh, um, and area trade-off. So here we can see that the 128 by 128 gives a very high sparsity as well as um, um, significant um, um, a reduction in the normalized area and, and energy. So on the right-hand side, I show um, the diet GNN method used for um, a specific data set, Amazon, for different levels of sparsity. So here we can see that we can prune is it, uh, we can prune the model up to um, 90%, half up to 90% um, uh, sparsity, and without any, with less than 1% accuracy drop. So, um, to summarize um, our results, we have, we show all five data sets. Uh, the sparsity here, we can see that um, the UGS method, which is the unified glass classification method proposed in some earlier works, um, achieves significantly lower um, um, accuracy compared to other methods. But the, our proposed method, um, that GNN achieves very high sparsity compared to um, other existing methods. Um, and also on the right hand side, we see that we don't, um, there is very little to, to less than 1% accuracy, um, accuracy drop. Um, so here we also show the area and energy savings for um, our method. So compared to other methods, CAP here represents other crossbar aware, crossbar aware pruning methods proposed in other works. Here we can see that we can um, reduce the amount of crossbars by um, more than 90% on average and also the um, energy consumption um, respectively. Um, so similarly, we also considered the um, computation and communication delay. So that's delayed, the delay due to um, com communication and computation overhead. And we found that there's 41% um, reduction in the communication delay and up to 58% reduction, average improvement in computation delay. So um, for the overall system speed up, we found that diet GNN um, achieves up to um, 87% um, speed up compared to um, the unpruned model as, um, and also 52% speed up compared to um, the crossbar web pruning methods. So a high level, um, so in conclusion, here we have shown that the Blueland based pruning architectures are good candidates for accelerating GNN training at the edge. And also GNN models, um, the diet GNN model prunes, um, the diet GNN method prunes um, GNN models um, and reduces the computer and communication overhead and this framework achieves up to 2.7 um, times speed up and 3.5 times um, reduction in um, energy efficiency during GNN training. Thank you. So I'll be taking questions. Thanks for thank for speakers. So, uh, any questions from audience? Okay. Uh, so let me introduce the speaker. Um, so uh, Dr. Hu Xiao graduated from the School of Computer Science and the National University of Defense Technology. He is currently a researcher and a master supervisor in the Institute of uh, Microelectronics. Uh, his research direction is embedded uh, processor uh, architecture, uh, processor testing and debugging and application. Uh, the current research interest is embedded uh, processor health management and the stability uh, technologies of processor uh, testability, uh, debugability, and the reliability. So, uh, yeah, welcome. Uh, uh, thank you. Hello, hello, everyone. Uh, uh, my name is Xiao Hu, and my topic is risk file based low cost embedded trace processing system. Uh, the motivation is uh, traditional on-chip trace debugging method of SOCs always use dedicated hardware circuit to eliminate all trace functions. It uses a large area over, uh, overhead in both storage and uh, data paths. Uh, the key challenge of on-chip trace debugging is how to flexibly handle massive trace information with limited on-chip hardware resources. Our method is we propose a low-cost embedded trace processing system. It's called LETPS. It employs and uh, enhances a light risk file based processor with customer-sized instructions. It's load and store trace, trace data. And the key idea of LETPS is handle trace data by exploring 
the uh, enter utilize the hardware resources. We transmit the trace data in idle time of slots of NOCs and the shared memory space of SOCs and employing the existing external interface of the SOC. Um, LETPS to achieve on chip trace debugging with low hardware cost, software independent feature, and minimal performance overhead. It can efficient, it's, a, it's effective in post silicon debug and the software optimization. This is our um, structure. It's composed by three main components. The first is RISC-V core based TPU. It's called Trace Processor Unit. It's serving as a master node. And uh, we have several TSU. It's called uh, Trace Slave Unit on each CPU cores. It can collect uh, parts and uh, memories and events of each modules. And uh, the trace data is collected from the past unit, past day TS unit, and collect into risk core five cores. And the risk five cores then send them into SOC's memories is separate uh, a minimal a minimal memory called the trace buffer. Then the trace buffer's data can be sent out by GMAC and SIO to the trace GUIs. This is the debug host PC. And this TPU can be debugged by the uh, high-speed UART. The workflow of it is sure like this. First, uh, the host PC its IDE can fake trace resources and method and compare and link TPU codes into bin and send to the bin codes into TPU. The SOC run the software and the TPU triggered and read and store and transferred the trace data into the host PC. Host PC analyze the trace information, visualize in GUIs. This, the visualization of LE TPS is shown in this. The information is displayed in time load graph. It's called LTLG. It includes pipelines, status graph with the pipeline information, includes CPI, CPI, catch messages, um, program store, data store, and idols. It also has the, the functions, uh, the data used, the data time used of each functions. And the second graph is functions core graph. That shows the start and the end time of each function executions. And the second, the, the third is paraphere event graph. It shows the status of interface ports and the data transitions, such as EDR, SIO, and UART. The application scenario is further as a complete rule of SOC operation process and data. It can determine the optimization methods and the evaluation effects. The user can use the data flow and the concurrency of data transfers and can analyze the multi-core load balance and the synchronization. And they can also track grand exceptions and uh, analyze performance bottleneck and the timing margins of a real system. In the future, LTTS will be enhanced to provide much more tools for analyze, monitor, and optimize the program behavior. The hardware overhead is low. The risk five core with 40 bytes data run and 40 bytes program run that consumes about 2,000 LTUs. 
and uh, 65, 65 kilo run base. Uh, well, a traditional trade system requires much more resources. RETBS stores data in the memory space of the target SOC inside the dedicated trace memories. The hardware overhead is greatly reduced. The performance overhead, the TPU's instructions is designed as a one cycle instruction with three stage pipeline. It can collect uh, informa trace information efficiently, and it generates uh, eight byte lines trace ATMs. It sends data to LOC bus every eight cycles, so that for uh, SOC running at one G micro frequency is low overhead. Our ETPS can process one hundred twenty twenty five micro trace ATMs per second. Oh, uh, that's all. Thanks. Uh, thanks for speaker. And any questions? Um, I actually have a simple question. So about the scalability of the approach. So, uh, so you use a three-stage pipeline uh, for for this file. So how about if we consider a more complicated, maybe uh, more pipeline stage or even after order execution? So if a RISC file architecture becomes more complicated, um, we will see the scalability of the approach of the propo uh, proposed uh, approach uh, facing some challenge. Um, uh, 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 pardon. So, <laughs> yeah, let me rephrase. Uh, I mean, if uh, the uh, this file like now maybe a relatively simple architecture, if I use a more com uh, complicated or more powerful uh, processor, so will this is a proposed uh, this the tracing or uh, this uh, testing uh, this method uh, face some challenge or face some scalability uh, challenge? Uh, yes, yes, yes. Uh... <laughs> It depends the requirement of the debug method. Uh, in, in the embedded processors, uh, risk five core is efficient and its, uh, its power can, uh, can do the trace collect uh, efficiently and uh, enough. Because, because yeah. the, the trace information is, is uh, less than, than um, uh, general processors. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Hello. Again, I have another question. Yes, please. Go ahead. You have mentioned that you use RISC V core, and uh, I have seen uh, in your slides you mentioned that. Did you customize some instructions for the RISC V core? Uh, sorry, I beg your pardon. Okay, can you hear me now? I want to ask that uh, I have seen in a slide that you use risk by core, and uh, uh, you also mentioned that there are some customized instructions. I'm very interested about the customized instructions about this file. Instructions. Oh, uh, we 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 designed several dedicated instructions um, because in risk file um, the the instructor the structure support support flexibility methods to design users. Instructions. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, if there's no other questions, and uh, thanks for speaker, and then, uh, so probably the audience can discuss with uh, uh, Doctor Wu in the post session more. So then, uh, 
let's go to uh, our next talk. Um, so next talk is about uh, emulation of uh, uh, biological tissues on uh, IPGA. And uh, uh, the speaker is uh, Jerry Jacob. Uh, so uh, Jerry Jacob currently pursuing PhD in the University of Auckland. Uh, his PhD is under the supervision of uh, uh, Dr. Paito. And uh, uh, his research is about uh, hard modeling for drug testing. And uh, the interests include uh, control engineering, uh, power systems, uh, bio engineering, and uh, computer programming. Um, is, uh, is yeah. So I think. Okay, we'll begin. A good day to one and all. Today we will look at an alternate model that is digital hardware friendly, especially on an FPGA. Potential using the OHARA model, 49 differential equations are required. However, the resonant model replicates the action potential in one equation in terms of Fourier series. A single resonator comprises of an integrator followed by another integrator. Digitally, the integrators are considered as registers. To add more complexity and capability, a state controller is used. This enhanced implementation will cater for autorhythmic and excitable cells, as well as changing wave shape under the influence of drugs or aging. The given illustration comprises of n cells connected together. Cell I minus one, I, I plus one are enlarged. Among them, cell I is shown in detail with a state controller comprising of resting state S1, upstroke state S2, and repolarization state S3. The figure shown here comprises of seven cells coupled together. Simulations are applied at cell one, when time t is 0 millisecond, cell 4 when time t is 500 milliseconds, and cell 7 when time t is 1000 milliseconds. At t is equal to 0 milliseconds, the wave front propagates from cell 1 to cell 7. At t is equal to 500 milliseconds, there is an outward propagation of the wave front. However, at t is equal to 1000 milliseconds, the wave front propagates from cell 7 to cell 1. In conclusion, one can, one can understand that the resonant model has clear benefits for FPGA implementation. Thank you. Yeah, thanks uh, for the speaker. Uh, so any questions from audience? So maybe I just ask a general question. So did you try uh, like other uh, like is, is a biological application acceleration on IPG besides this one? Uh, come again, I didn't get you, I'm sorry. Yeah, I mean, uh, this is a, a definitely very interesting to accelerate any uh, like biosignal processing on IPG. So I'm just wondering, so uh, uh, how many kind of uh, related applications you have tried? to accelerate on IPJ? Um, currently, right now, we have only completed the simulation part on model sim. We have uh, implemented all the state controller and everything on model sim, and we are looking to looking to find a very smart way to smart way to reduce the resource usage on model sim. And very soon, we will be jumping into the hardware processing. We are using the Cyclone 5 SOC to cater uh, cater to uh, to do all the cell modeling as well as the tissue modeling. So that is another thing, and it's a work in progress. Okay, great. Yeah, looking forward to see the final results. Uh, Thank you very thanks. much. Um, okay, so if there's uh, no uh, further questions, so uh, probably uh, we can proceed to the uh, our last talk now. Uh, pause. For the last talk, so it's about the uh, Margo per uh, uh, ML guided uh, in, in linear uh, to optimize performance. So uh, this talk is from uh, Amma Aishuri. 
So uh, I'm uh, actually a uh, senior R&D engineer at Huawei Heterogeneous Compiler Lab in Toronto, working on automatic tuning and optimizing uh, compilers using machine learning. Uh, prior to joining Huawei Canada, he was a postdoc uh, researcher fellow uh, at the University of Toronto, uh, tackling accelerating uh, deep learning applications. So uh, welcome, uh, Dr. Ashuri. Hello, everyone. Thanks for having me. Can you hear me well and see my share slide? Yes. Great. All right. Um, thanks for the introduction. Uh, my name is Amir Ashuri. I'd like to present our uh, latest work at um, Huawei Heterogeneous Lab in Toronto, Canada, uh, named MLGoPerf and ML Guided Inliner to optimize performance. So, um, as you all know, function inlining optimization is one of those uh, major optimization inside any compiler, uh, you know, framework. For instance, LVM or GCC. As a pros, it's going to reduce the overhead uh, due to entering and exiting functions. So that will itself eliminate the instruction requires for doing the function aligning. And in certain cases, it's gonna reduce the register spilling. Um, as in many compiler, uh, instead of the odd compilers such as LVM, many optimizations are coming after inlining in um, you know, standard optimization pipelines such as dash O2 or dash O3. So having a good and intelligent inliner is gonna open up opportunities for your subsequent passes as well. As the obvious cons of having an aggressive inlining, definitely it's gonna increase the code size of the application by you know, um, inlining the, the function bodies uh, into the, uh, the Kali, uh, the, uh, the color. And in certain cases, larger code size can reduce the temporal locality. So you're gonna have um, issues with your uh, you know, instruction cache, cache misses. So for instance, in LVM, which is uh, one of the state-of-the-art compilers, we have several factors to consider when we inline a call site. So one of which is uh, the Kali size. So usually it's better to align a smaller function and leave the larger one as, as they are, right? The other uh, point to consider is the hotness of the call site. As um, a small example, I brought one of those Head of files considering uh, many, uh, you know, inline costs and what they call magic numbers in LLVM. So you see, there are so many variants and factors involved when you want to decide on inlining a call site. So, in April 2020, uh, Google released their first uh, version of MLGo, which stands for ML guided, uh, ML based guided inliner, which was later upstream into the community version of LLVM into their uh, GitHub. So what they did was to try to use a machine learning model based on reinforcement learning to decide whether or not to inline a call site. And, um, but the metrics involved was only to tackle code size. So the authors show that by having an intelligent inliner using their reinforcement learning agent, they're able to outperform the baseline level for code size reduction in LLVM, which is called dash OZ by certain percentages, as you see in the, in the table two that I brought from the, the paper um, here. So for more information, feel free to, to have a read of that paper that I um, you know, mentioned in the foot, uh, footnote section. So MLGO Perf uh, provides an extension over the uh, Google's MLGO, which is now an LLVM upstream uh, uh, you know, tool inside the function inlining optimization. So what we did instead is to target performance rather than code size. In order to do that, we applied and employed a secondary ML model for which we call that IR2Perf, uh, that it's gonna predict the function speed up of a post inlining to help generate the rewards needed to train the, uh, the actual model, which was the enforcement learning model. Uh, as you can see, uh, training an RL agent normally is a tricky task. You're going to need to generate rewards at each iteration. So you're going to have to train it for multiple rounds. And in reality, and specifically in real world applications such as spec benchmark, uh, each iteration takes several minutes. So if you want to um, run multiple thousand times, technically it's not going to be uh, possible in a timely manner. So 
we needed an, uh, another ML model to provide us with the rewards needed to train the, the RL model. But now it is retargeted to you know, um, tackle performance rather than code size. So we handcrafted 20 uh, features taken from uh, you know, uh, post inlining and we implemented the pass that we registered at after uh, you know, function inlining inside LVM. And then by capturing those handcrafted features, we were able to feed to our IR2Perf model and it would generate us the rewards. So in a high level, um, our you know, high level flow um, comprises of two models. So one of which, as I mentioned, is IR2Perf on top. So it's gonna receive as input the function features that we handcrafted, those 20 handcrafted features, and it's gonna predict a function speed up over the baseline. The baseline here was dash 03. So the rewards is used at each iteration to you know, train the, the existing RL model. Now it is retargeted for performance rather than code size. And it has in, uh, its own set of features, which is the features of the colleague. So by integrating these two models in, uh, together, we have three phases. So at uh, first number one, we were training IR2Perf, the one on top, without the, uh, the need for RL model. After IR2Perf was sufficiently trend, uh, trained, at inference uh, you know, phase for IR2Perf, we were trying to generate rewards and train the second model. And when the second model was trained, we would simply unplug the first one, which is IR2Perf, and the second model would go into its inference mode and provides us standalone uh, you know, um, inference as the final action. And the action was to, when the uh, LBM sees uh, you know, a call site, or such as this, it's gonna have a decision to make a Boolean action, whether or not to inline this call site. So I'm not gonna go into more details that the, the details are in the paper and I provide the, uh, the reference at the end of the slides, but as a snapshot of the, uh, the results we, we were achieved is if we deploy MLGO perf uh, on spec, which was the, the, the benchmark of our target, we were able to speed up the uh, benchmark overall by a geometric mean of 1.8% with respect to O3. And as you all can imagine, by having a, a more intelligent inlining, we were able to open up more opportunities shown here by around 3%, um, a little bit than 1% more than the original MLGO and also 1.2% uh, more than uh, the standard baseline O3 with respect to what is the, um, the standard optimization inside LVM. As a cost, as an overhead to pay by using MLGO perf and spinning up the application, our code size increased by 17% with respect to O3 and by around 20% with respect to MLGO. But note that MLGO was only, the, um, was only trained for you know, reducing code size and not performance. Our target here was to optimize performance rather than code size. So it is uh, acceptable to have certain amount of code size in our uh, you know, benchmarks of target. Um, I'm just gonna conclude my talk here and feel free to have a look at the, um, the full version that is, it has been recently uploaded to archive and feel free to ask questions um, sent to me by email. Uh, thank you for your um, attention. Yeah, thanks to the speaker. Uh, any questions uh, from audience? So, uh, yeah. Hi. Any questions? Um, yeah. I have questions. Uh, uh, also, you mentioned the ML reports can provide more. Uh, uh, optimizing opportunities, such as really, can you tell, uh, can you tell about this, why it can provide more uh, optimizing opportunities? Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear well. Could you repeat the question? Thank you. Uh, okay, I, I saw that you mentioned the ML report can provide, uh, yes, yeah, it's right. Yeah, providing more opportunities for uh, of my business, such as you know, with 
pretty good calculable to model on this effect. I see. Uh, sure. So if you, I should add, I'm hitting the slides here. So if, if you take a look at the, um, the pipeline of O3, which is the standard optimization at highest level in LLVM, there are around 160 optimization inside. So in line is placed somewhat around the 30th and or 40th position. So after inlining, you have several optimizations that can benefit from an intelligent inliner, two of which are loop and roll and loop vectorize. So in this experiment, we wanted to see having three different compilers, uh, which are O3, the standard vanilla LLVM, MLGo and MLGoPerf, uh, what's gonna be the amount of increased code regions or simply places that we can tune provided by intelligent inliner. So each of these three provides some sort of an inlining version. So by having an, a, a, a design of experiment by having an auto tuner, we auto tune those uh, you know, uh, those code regions that has happened after the inlining. And we noticed that if we auto tune with uh, loop and roll and loop vectorize, ML go perf inliner provide us with more opportunities. You see, we have tunable region for each of those versions, but on average, the uh, ML go perf tunable region has increased and some of those has translated into a higher performance. That's why after, at the end of the auto tuning process, we have gained 2.5% increase with vanilla LLVM, 2.7% increase with MLGo, and 3.7% increase with MLGo Perf. And that's, that's the result of having a, a, a more intelligent way of inlining. So it's gonna open up more opportunities for loop and roll and loop vectorizer. Thank you, thank you. No problem. Okay, so any other questions? Okay, yeah, uh, so if no uh, further questions, thanks uh, to Emma again. And uh, so actually this is uh, our last talk in this session. And uh, so these uh, six talks are all very interesting and uh, thanks uh, for all the speakers and audience again. So uh, basically we, uh, we need to conclude our session here because we are running out of time. But uh, the final remember, re uh, reminder is that, uh, so uh, welcome all the speakers and uh, the uh, audience to go to the uh, post a session at the bond and to discuss with all the authors more before any of the uh, questions that are interested. Okay, uh, so thanks all, and uh, this concludes the session. Uh, see you around.